Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. I'm Alex, and this is Prime Miniatures, and uh, I know it's been a bit too long since my last upload, where I said I'd be reviewing Green Stuff World Pure Metal Pigments, but um, yeah, I'm not doing that. The, the pigments are cool and all, but I really haven't found a good use for them, so uh, that's that. Instead, today we're showing off some fluorescent pink squigs that you can see on my Instagram. These guys are absolutely popping off and I really don't think the camera does them justice. I've done some pink squigs before with uh, varying success, but these are 100% the best I've done them. So I really dig it, so that's why there's going to be a video on them. <laughs> I used this method on my squig hoppers, first of all, and it looked really great, so I decided to record myself doing some on some larger models so I can share the method with all of you. Now, before we get into it, let's take a word from uh, my sponsor, me. Uh, I currently have a Kickstarter running for a model I sculpted called the Animated Shipwreck. So if you really want to have a big, weird ship monster thing to go with your vampire pirates army that you totally have, uh, then consider checking it out at the link below. Um, and if you're not watching this um, immediately on release, get the medal on my My Mini Factory or my Colts 3D page, which are also linked down below. Alright, so now that's out of the way, let's talk paints. Um, I have two things to say. First of all, all my paints are listed down below or when they pop up on the screen. Uh, two, um, none of the precise paints matter all that much. I use a couple of contrast paints and a fluorescent paint, but realistically there's good alternatives to all of these. Hell, I, uh, I painted my first fluorescent squigs with a set of £2 toy fluorescent paints that I got in the discount bin of my local hobby craft, and they were basically the same as the scale colour floor paint that I'm using now. Um, so yeah, it, it doesn't matter all that much. Um, another example is the um, base coat colour, which is Scale 75 Sunset Purple, um, and I really shouldn't have used it as a base coat because Scale 75s aren't great for that, because I did it in an airbrush and they're generally, they're quite thick, um, but also quite um, transparent, so they're not great airbrush paints, but it worked and I liked it, so that's what I used. Um, you guys can just use, you know, any warmish purple or mix your own. Um, oh, on the topic of mixing, all the grey on the teeth and stuff were basically just mixed black and white, and there's no precise measurements there, so you don't need to use specific, you know, Space Wolf grey or whatever. Um, might help if you do. Um, personally, if I wasn't so cheap, I'd probably buy my own set of greys and just do that instead of mixing them. Um, but hey, uh, that's, a, that's what I did. Alright, so starting off, I used an airbrush. And uh, yeah, I know I said no airbrush in the title, but really that was more of a suggestion than a rule. <laughs> you can paint it with a brush, whatever, that's fine. Um, or you can use a rattle can if, you know, you can find a purple rattle can somewhere. Army painter, maybe? Um, the main point here is that we're undershading those shadows in, and by adding in the blue and reddish tones from the purple, um, it'll make the bouncing pink ball feel more alive. Once that's done, we can use our secret weapon, dry brushing. So something I learned after my first experiment with fluorescence is that they cover like shit, and so my very first attempt I tried to build up from a fuchsia colour into a pink using like a traditional layering style and it, it really, really didn't, really didn't work. Um, these paints cover really poorly, um, and that doesn't matter that much in the brand as far as I can tell either. Um, and so they showed through a lot of like the under underlying colour tones, which makes them really, really good over white colours and really bright stuff, which don't have much colour of their own. So over this purple, we're dry brushing on a nice pale sand. The brush I'm using for this isn't a, uh, a fancy artist opus 70 pound dry brush um, because like I said I'm cheap um, so I'm using these cool double-sided makeup brushes and they cost about one pound each they have a soft side and a firm side um, and both sides have their uses but we're going to be using the soft side for most of this um, and now we start brushing and we just start brushing oh lord do we start brushing um, make sure you work the paint in to begin with and then get rid of any excess the first dip into your wet paint is always the most saturating, and that's where you have to be careful. Make sure you wipe it off well enough, and especially on the sides. I find that most of the time when I mess up when dry brushing is because there's too much paint on the sides of the brush, and when I really get in there, it's, it's touching those sides of the brush in places, 
and uh, yeah, ruining the dry brush effect. So uh, yeah, that's my top tip for the episode, I guess. So now as we're dry brushing away here, and, and yeah, we're going to be dry brushing for a long, long time. Um, remember, try and think about those little bristles. Each one of those bristles is independently being moved around and pushed around by our hand. Um, and we want to get it into all those little cracks and crevices. This isn't a pen that we're just sort of smushing around or like a, a lay brush that we're just aiming for specific places. It's like a feather duster and we're, we're not being light with it, but we're not being firm with it. We want to get it into all the little crevices and pick up the dust, um, but not scrub it with it. We want those tiny bristles to go wherever they need to go. And we're applying heavily, um, but I don't mean we're scrubbing hard. I mean, we're taking our time and we're trying to cover the model. A lot of the time when you dry brush, you really, you're just sort of looking to try and pick out those highlights and stuff, but here we're after mid-tones. And so that's like, like I said, a lot of time. Just take your time, make sure everything's picked out. Almost every part of the model should have like a little bit of this mid-tone on it. Once you're finally happy with that and it's looking good, um, it's time to go for highlights. So for that, we just use white. Um, this is again, AK Interactive. Um, and here, here we are focusing on the highlights and we are being careful and we're just sort of aiming for those focal points. Anything that we think is important anywhere the light might catch, like, you know, around the eyes or, you know, whatever. Now, uh, you might be wondering, I know you're painting the Mangla Squig, but hey, what's that other model? Well, uh, have I got new some news for you? Uh, this is a 3D printed model designed by yours truly, titled the Bruiser Big Mouth. And it's a big mouth monster that you can find for free on my mini factory and cuts 3D pages uh, down below. And this is the start of a regular release schedule for a few of these guys every month, for those of you who need more and bigger mouths in their lives. Alongside the Bruiser Big Mouth, we have such legends as the Zombie Big Mouth and the Devil Big Mouth, all of which I think are super fun little characters that you can paint. And the best part about these models is that they're completely free. Um, hopefully I'm gonna be adding more and more to them every month over time. And uh, yeah, they'll be free forever and no paywall. So if you like them, uh, go grab them. Well, look at that, two soft promotions and one video. Isn't that cool? Anyway, now with all the values sketched in there, it's time for the main event, which is adding the pink. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm using uh, scale 75 FX floor acid pink for this, but really all, all the fluorescents are basically the same as far as I can tell. And the goal here is to be glazing this in over the top. And of course, this can be done with an airbrush. Again, airbrush optional, but really is not necessary. Don't feel like you need to use an airbrush. Uh, don't click off if you've not got an airbrush. Um, personally, I don't even like using an airbrush for this. So um, even for these really big models, I decided to whip out the brush and just use nice thinnish glazes, not too thin. Um, just, just about right because this is quite transparent already, not very covering, um, but just you want to get it flowing nicely and so you can smooth it around. And we're just going to apply a load of these glazes to build up the cover. Now, um, yeah, as I said, it takes a while, it takes a few coats, um, about four to five coats really, depending on the model, uh, really to get it looking good. And uh, yeah, I know what you're thinking, that's a long time and yeah. Yep, yeah, it's a long time. Um, and I know what else you're probably thinking, wouldn't an airbrush job look nicer as well as quicker? Um, and no, no, not really. Um, for instance, on my squig hoppers, I more or less did half with an airbrush and half with a brush. Um, so I'm gonna show you a few now and I want you guys to think, hey, which one of these was brushed and which one was airbrushed? Okay, which which, which were which? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. You guys might be able to tell the difference. Um, I can't. Uh, the only one I know was airbrushed was this one because there's some overspray and it means the rock's a little bit pinkish and I didn't cover it up properly. Um, but realistically, there's nothing magic about the airbrush. Um, it, it is quicker. I can't say it's not quicker, but it's not really better. Um, not at all. Now, uh, one note I do want to add is that there is a downside to the brush, which is if, like me, you over thin your paint at first or you apply too much of it and it pulls, you end up with places where the pink pigment really like settles into the dark recesses. And this really sucks and you should try to avoid it, but we could do some stuff to hide it and clean it up later. 
On the other hand, the problems I sometimes fall into with airbrushing is if you become overzealous and oversaturate the model and you know, in whatever colour you're putting over the top. Now, um, it's sort of harder to do this um, for some other colours um, but when, when you're glazing over an undershade, but it is still possible. So, you know, be careful. Um, you can always add more paint, but you can't take it away. Um, and yeah, it can, it can be easy to overdo it with a airbrush. So now we have the squig skin mostly sorted. Um, but I don't want this video to drag on forever and you guys only really care about the skin, hopefully, well probably. In some places you might think the skin is a bit blown out, too pink, not enough wire, uh, dark shadows. Um, most of the time this is what makes the model really killer. Um, dark shadows, bright brights. So we need to bring it up in places and uh, we need to bring it down in places. And to bring it up, what we're going to do is we're going to mix a bit of pink in with a bit of white, just to make a sort of, um, you know, a very bright, bright pinkish white and we're going to go back to our dry brush and we're going to dry brush over in places just to pick that out just to do the absolute high lines um now you know we want to be really careful about this make sure you're using the soft side of your brush and just be delicate you just want to brush it with like the tip of it you don't want to get it in there you're not trying to work it in like we were earlier in terms of shading down um we're going to be using caribou crimson games workshop wash for this um, I also like to mix in a little bit of the acid pink paint that I used um, and that does two things. First of all, it increases the surface tension, um, so it basically stays where I want it to be, it, it'll be less runny. And also it means it blends in a little bit more nicely with all those layers that we've already applied. The one place um, I used it completely neat, like pure caribou crimson, is those mistakes I mentioned where the pink pigment got stuck in the crevices. This covers up those mistakes and places the shadow right back where it needs to be. And there you are. The skin is the most important part of the squigs and uh, the rest you can really do however you want it. Uh, so I I'm going to rush through it, really. So uh, it's time to fast forward a little bit. The gums are actually pretty cool. Um, on my first squigs I painted them with glow-in-the-dark paint that were part of that cheap hobbycraft paint set I told you about. Um, and it's so fun and quirky but it really isn't that special on the actual model. Um, but I did think that the greenish white tone that you get from glow in the dark stuff um, actually looks sort of cool next to the bright pink. So I basically did the same here, but I faked it. Um, I used a mix of, well, I used a base coat of pale sand and then applied a mix of white and Beale Tan Green GW wash. Um, and yeah, it's a bit weird that I'm mixing a wash with a paint, but it makes it a pretty cool layer color. You know, it gives it a lot of fluidity and yeah, it makes it a bit transparent. So I'm building up layers with that white and green mix and then I'm applying the Beal Beal Tan Green wash in the recesses. And I go back and forth a bit with, um, with more white in the mix as I get higher up until there's a good pop and a nice looking pale green gums. I choose to paint the teethies on the squigs in grey tones. It makes them look a bit different from all the other um, teeth out there which are always like brown ish bone colored coffee stained teeth um but in my opinion it goes pretty nicely with the pink maybe it's something to do with the cold gray contrasting with the warm pink but uh, i don't know i'm not an artist so really there's nothing special going on here i'm layering from blackish gray up to whitish gray um all by mixing white and black paint um in this case it's, it's the mars black heavy body acrylic um by uh i don't know wins and newton i think uh, but it's really not very good. I wouldn't recommend it. it. It sucks. Don't use it. The one trick I actually do do um, is also not that great and that's by mixing in black contrast paint. Um, that's black Templar contrast paint um, with a bit of flow improver and that means they all like run into those recesses easier and um, you can do a sort of like a fake pin wash, like a targeted recess wash with it a little bit more easily. Um, but in places I found it sort of made a bit of a mess of the bruiser big mouth. And that was a bit of a pain. It probably would have been better just to have been neater. Um, but yeah, by and large, it's it's something I wasn't really happy with when I was painting it, so I kept going back, um, you know, applying another mid-tone to smooth up blends, applying a bit more wash to darken the shadows, and applying more highlights to bring it up. You, you really just need to play with it until you're happy with what you've got. And um, yeah, that, that's that. The blue tongue on the mangle squig was wet blended um, using Prussian blue by Vallejo, uh, boreal green for the bottom of the tongue and the floor of the mouth, and I use scale colours, fantasy and game, amarth blue, um, and wet blended that in for the highlights. 
all in all, it's a bit of a slap job. I, I can't really say more than that, but I should, probably should have spent some, you know, more time on this, but I was pretty gassed by this point of the paint job and just wanted to do it quickly, get a bit of colour on there, get a bit of contrast. And uh, all in all, I think it's fine. All the metal bits, I just sort of painted in metal colours. It's really nothing special. I didn't even wash it. Um, I used Vallejo metal colours. Um, they're the best range for metallics. They're absolutely awesome. If you don't use them already, you probably should give it a go. Um, steel for base coat and then a little bit of silver applied gently for highlights and stuff. And that's basically all the parts of the squig done, apart from the eyes, which are just sort of dotted with a bit of um, yellow contrast paint. Um, that is iandant yellow. Um, and yeah, um, there's still goblins and stuff on the models, um, but really just check out my past video for that, just to, you know, how to paint goblins, whatever. Um, you might have to turn the volume up on it, that's what a lot of people are saying. <laughs> and there we are, the pink squigs are done, and they don't look too bad. Pretty sure the colors method would work for any of the fluorescent colors. Um, apart from if you're doing like blue or something, maybe swap the pale sand, like the off-white bone color for more of a white grey or something, like a, a very lightly greyish white. Um, but yeah, undershading with a dry brush really rocks for these sort of hyper-saturated colours. So give it a go next time you want some popping colours over some organic looking textures. If you like this video, um, remember to like and subscribe. If you didn't like this video, also consider liking and subscribing, but also leave a comment to let me know what you think I should do better for next time. Uh, I've been Alex, and I'll see you guys again soon, maybe.